Hello, welcome back to Cracking the Cryptic. Uh, on screen you can see a partial solve of Friday's diabolical rated puzzle from the Daily Telegraph. Um, these are very, very difficult Sudoku puzzles um, appear on Fridays each week. Uh, and yeah, we, we tend to at the weekends, we run through some of the logic involved in the, in the final steps. Uh, so the black numbers were the given numbers. If you want to do it from the start, um, just have a look at those. Um, the blue numbers, or the blue big numbers, are numbers you could get relatively easily. And then the pencil marks, the small numbers you can see, are the pencil marks that I was relying on at the point that I started to make progress with the final steps. Now, what I'm going to talk about firstly is... Um, a red or a wild goose chase that I went down um, and I thought it might still be worth just covering it because it, it is some interesting logic. I I focused in on this 4-9 pair here and I noticed that both of these cells could also contain the numbers 4 and 9 and that got me wondering about this uh, a uniqueness point so I think if I just remove these two possibilities. If I remove the 6 from here and the 5 from here, you could see, hopefully, that if we ended up with these four squares containing these four possibilities, this puzzle would have a fundamental problem um, because it would have two solutions. And what, what do I mean when I say that? Well, I mean that if in the printed solution this was a 4 and this was a 9, so this was a 9 and this was a 4, we could stare at that and we could say, well, how could we have told that this was intended to be the correct solution? Because if this was a 9 and this was a 4, and this was a 4 and this was a 9, that would be equally as valid. There is no way that the internal logic of the puzzle can tell you which of those two solutions is the correct one. So we always know when we do a Sudoku puzzle, especially in a quality newspaper like Daily Telegraph, that we can never end up with that so-called deadly pattern. So I was looking at this and I, I had this 5-6 pair at the same time and there's quite an interesting thing that's going on between the choices with this 5-6 pair and the fact that we have a 6 here and a 5 here. In particular I could see that it would be impossible for there to be a 5 or a 6 anywhere else in column 6. Um, now why do I say that? Let, let's take as an example, let's say this square here did end up containing a 5. Why does that give us a problem? Well you can immediately see that will make this cell a 6. The 5 and the 6 in the column will then reduce mm -hmm. this to a 6 and a 5 and we'll have um, we'll have the deadly pattern. So. I was able, using that, to remove the 5 and the 6 from this square as a possibility and give myself this 2-4 pair uh, in, the, in this square here, which I then spent a long time staring at and, and not making any progress. So, um, that, you know, it's just an interesting point. Always be on the lookout for this deadly pattern, especially if uh, in, in a column you have uh, another cell which is limited to just two possibilities. Now, in fact, if you stare at this, uh, this square or this collection of four cells long enough, you can also see there's another problem with them. So we know we're trying to avoid having a 4-9 possibility in each of them. Well, sometimes when you look at these so-called um, unique rectangles, I think that's the technical expression, you can see that if you pick one of the numbers, you end up with a problem anyway. So if, for example, if we sit there at this square, ask yourself whether all three options there are really possible. In particular, let's think about the number 4. What happens if this is a number 4? If this is a 4, this is forced to be a 9. This is forced to be a 4. And now, this is forced to be a 9 because there's no other place in row 9 for a 9 to go. This would be the only remaining slot and we'd end up with exactly this deadly pattern we're trying to avoid. So we can't put a 4 in this cell. It, it is not valid. So we can remove this and we end up with another nice 6-9 pair in this cell 
and I stared at that for a little while as well and I couldn't see how to, how to make use of it. Now in fact th there are a variety of ways to make progress from here. One way of doing it, which is quite a good way on, in terms of these very hard puzzles, is to uh, you could notate all of the cells that only contained exactly two numbers um, and then you can try and see if you can create long chains, forced chains, using uh, using those cells that only have two solutions. So, for example, if we go up here, look at this cell. What happens if this cell is a 4 or a 9? If it's a 4, um, the chain ends quite quickly. You can see that. It affects this cell, but that doesn't really affect much else. If it's a 9, you can go off on a whole long uh, force chain. Because if this is a 9, this will be a 1, therefore this will be a 5, therefore this will be a 4. And once you get there, you should immediately pause. Because if you remember, what we did in order to create the 4 here is we chose not to have a 4 in this cell. So we know that whether or not this cell is a 4, well, whether it's a 4 or whether it's a 9, there will either be a 4 here or a 4 here in the finished solution. Therefore, any cell that can see both this cell and this cell, we can eliminate a 4 from. And if we scan up the column, we can see this cell here is a candidate. So we would be able to remove a 4 here. So that's one way of getting the next step in terms of this puzzle. Another way that you might notice is if you if you look at column 4, and I'll highlight the numbers on the, on the screen now that you need to look at, you can see that we have a bent quadruple. Um, this 1, 4, 5, 7 combination going up the column and round into this square here is interesting for the same reason. It has the same effect on this cell. And what, why do I say that? Well, let's imagine for a moment Let's look at this cell. This cell can take two possibilities. If it's a 4, this cell is forced to be a 2. If it's a 7, what happens? If it's a 7, we get a 1, 4, 5 triple in the column. This is 1, 4, this is 1, 5, this is 4, 5. So again, we would eliminate the 4 from this cell. So whether this is a 4 or a 7, this cell cannot contain a 4. All of that would give us a nice 2 there, that gives us a nice 2 there, um, and then we've got, I guess, what's that could be, 4 or a 9, I think that's right. And once again here, you should just take a quick stare at the grid, we've covered this next technique a lot in the past, but it's the Y-wing. And a Y-wing isn't a bent quadruple, it's a lot simpler, it's a bent triple. So let's look at the numbers 4, 5 and 9. So we have a 4, 5 here, a 5, 9 here, and a 4, 9 here. So it's a triple, but it's sort of not all in the same column. It's slightly bent, but this cell here, this, this third component of the triple, does share a box with this one, so that th there is an interaction of the logic between this cell and this cell. And you can see here that Again, if we go to the central cell of the Y-wing, which is always the place to look, that's the so-called pivot cell. If this is a 5, what happens? If this is a 5, this is forced to be a 4. If, on the other hand, this is a 9, this is forced to be a 4. So again, we have this sort of interaction where, the, where, where we know that the finished solution will either have a 4 in this square or it will have a 4 in this square. So that allows us to hunt round the grid for cells that can see both this square and this square because we know those cells can't contain a 4. Now, the obvious candidate here is this one, where we have the, co the only possibilities left of a 4 or a 7. Well, the 4 is definitely not possible. And once you remove the 7 from this square, the puzzle really does collapse because then we get the 7 here, the 8 here, gives us an 8 here, etc, etc, and it all becomes rather easier from that point forward. So quite a few different techniques covered today. Um, the first two techniques to do with this um, 
a unique rectangle down here. We're of no help to solving the puzzle, so sorry if, uh, if you know you only want to know the techniques that definitely work. I thought it was interesting also to cover those techniques that sometimes don't take you along the right lines, but might do on the next diabolical Sudoku. Um, but thanks for watching. If you enjoy the channel, um, please tell your friends about us. Actually, um, you know we're trying to grow our audience over time, and that really helps. Do subscribe uh, to the content if you enjoy it, and we'll see you again soon on Cracking the Cryptic.